name is Nick Berry. The obligatory bio slide. Um, I graduated in 1988 in uh, aircraft science and rocket science, and uh, rather than getting in the aerospace industry, I decided to start a software company with some friends, and we produced a product called AutoRoot and AutoMap, which we sold to Microsoft in 1994. I spent the next 15 years working at Microsoft, 10 years in the uh, MSN gaming zone. They finally kicked me out, so I joined Real Networks, where I was the GM for Analytics Game House, and now I have a fool for a boss because I work for myself, and I have a consulting company called Data Genetics. That's all out of the way. As Dave mentioned, I do talk very, very quickly. If you're going to try and make notes, you're going to lose. These slides will be available uh, as soon as I finish speaking here today. Agenda. I'm going to start slowly by talking about what is social gaming. I'm going to get a little bit faster by telling why it's so popular. And then we're going to get into the meat of the presentation, where how I'm going to tell you you can find out more about your download customers than you thought you knew. Then we're going to take some detours, because I love data, and we're going to go off on tangents and more tangents and more tangents. But I'm going to bring it back with a real example right at the end. Question. What is a social game? And we have, I'm sure everyone's always heard the phrase, they're not social. And you're right. Most social games tend to be standalone experiences. So it's not the fact that they're social that we call them social games. And after all, casual games aren't very casual either. So a better definition is a game played on a social network. And I think we can all agree, certainly, that social games are played in a social network, so that's, that's not a problem. But now it comes down to the definition of what really is a game. So, what is... Oh, this click didn't work. So what is a game? When I show my wife various games on Facebook, she says, that's not a game, that's work. It's like push the button and the pellet comes out, we all talked about today. So a game has to be something that is not work. And scratching my head and someone coming around with lots of, sort of things together, the idea I've come up with is something... It's a non-obligatory activity that is performed for fun. So remember that, because I'm going to be asking questions about it a little bit later. Tying it all together, then, a social game is a non-obligatory activity that is performed for fun on a social network. Non-obligatory, this is important. For fun, this is important. And on a social network, all these things are very important. And I think we should stop being snobs here and saying, hey, this activity is not a game just because it's just a follow the bouncing ball. That's not a problem. You know, doodling is a game. Skipping stones is just as much a game as chess or checkers or spades or anything else. So remember, non-obligatory activity performed for fun. So why are social games so popular? Again, there are plenty of non-obligatory activities on Facebook. There are three real components, in my humble opinion, about why uh, social games are so popular. The first is discoverability. There are three quarters of a billion people and you probably won't be able to read this text, we can read it later, but Facebook has exposed copious quantities of non-obligatory fun activities to lots of people. And what they tend to do is they broadcast their activities, either actively or passively, saying, hey, I'm playing this game. We've all seen little feeds go up uh, about what people are doing. This leads to accessibility. With one click or two clicks, you can be jumping into the latest bandwagon of non-obligatory sort of uh, fun activities. This then leads into camaraderie. Um, social is a bad adjective to talk about social games because they're not tend to be social, but albeit asynchronously, people who've been up to level 10 in Farmville have all been through the same experience. And so it's something to talk about the water cooler. Hey, how do you do this? How things are going on? And then with the concept of challenges and invites and peer pressure, it reads back into um, discoverability, saying, hey, I've got to level 13, or I'm really good at this score in Bejewel Blitz. How are you doing? And that's what loops it all together. So, what do you know about this? Because do you all remember what a, uh, a social game is? Yeah, just, just checking. A non-obligatory activity. If you're a social game developer, you have it easy. You probably know the gender of your customers. You know the age of your customers. You tend to know which ones are playing poker. You know which ones have got farms. You know which ones are playing with beach balls. You know which ones cost you lots of money. If you don't have an analytics team, you're running a social uh, game development company, you're stupid. Uh, there's no other way to describe it. You, it it's, it's very easy to do. And with A-B testing and all the other presentations we've seen about today, using statistics and other things and funneling, you should be able to um, improve your return on investment. But what do you know about your deluxe download customers? The chances are nothing. You've sold them a game, and that's it. You probably don't even know who they are. Or do you? And that's what the rest of this presentation is going to be about. If you've sold somebody a game, chances are you have a sales database. Here's a sales database. 
He probably has a sales date, a sales value, a credit card name, and a credit card number. And here's an example of some of those records. You see sale, name. Look here, we have a credit card name. In this case, it's my name. And it's also my credit card number as well, but I, I've greeked out the middle part. What's in a name? My name is Nicholas. If you hadn't met me before, the chances are you think I'm a guy. And that's right, I have a Y chromosome. Just about everybody called Nicholas is a boy or a man. Jessica is a girl's name. Chances are, if you meet someone called Jessica, you know they're a girl. But what about somewhere in between? What are those androgynous names? Taylor. I'm sure people know people here called Taylor. Taylor's kind of those names that sort of uh, swings both ways. It could be a boy or, or, or it could be a girl. So how do we find out about what percentage of those androgynous names are males and females to help us with knowing about our customers? Well, the Social Security Administration has this wonderful database uh, which talks about all the registered names from 1880 all the way to 2009. And if you haven't worked out, this is where we're going down a little bit of a, uh, of a, of a tangent that's sort of down here. Here's an example of some of the data. It gives you some names, uh, the frequency, and the year. Loading all that into a big SQL server, we've got this da database. And here we have a history of male names for those interested. This is by decade, uh, 18s, 1890s, 1900s, all the way through. You can see back in the 1880s, John was a very popular first name, William, James, Frank. Over here now, uh, people like to call their, their boys Jacob, Michael, Joshua. Nobody calls their child Clarence anymore or Willie. And you can see the change of, uh, of names over the years. Here are female names. Mary, for three quarters of a century, was the most popular name given to, to women. Uh, you can see Anna's fallen off, uh, Emma's come back again. Again, nobody calls their children Minnie, Ida, Bertha, or Ethel anymore. Remember that because it's going to come back to uh, for some of the further slides. Just to name, no, more to sort of tangent off to one side. Scrabble. Um, Scrabble has a, um, a scoring system sort of based on the frequency of letters. And I know names are officially proper now, so we can't supposed to use them. But more recently, it's been becoming quite trendy to have creative spellings with names. And you'll see, notice that uh, Z's or Z's replacing letter S's in names and Y's and I's. And if you look at Z, you get 10 points for, uh, and Y, you get four points rather than one. And so um, if you spell your child's name Isabella, you'd get 33 points rather than Isabella, you'd get 11 points. So over the years, you'll find the average Scrabble score of the 1800s has gone all the way up to here. So a little bit of trivia here, because we're trying to make it lighthearted. Uh, out of the uh, 86, uh, 87,000 distinct names, the highest scoring name is Jasmine. You get 38 points for that. Okay, returning to androgynous names, in 2009, if, you, if your child was named Alex, the chances are it would be a boy. Uh, Christopher, that's uh, exclusively a boy's name. Dakota, kind of more girls named the boy's name. Dylan, Emerson, George, I'll go through it. Taylor, in 2009, Taylor was predominantly a girl's name. Although, of course, not everybody was born in 2009. Some people were born in 2008, 7, 6. So what we need to do is actually go back and look at the distribution of uh, tailors over the years. And we can see that actually in 19... There were actually more uh, tailors registered as boys, and tailors peaked in popularity. So if somebody knocked on the door, and the door was closed, and he said, hi, my name's Taylor, you want to work out what the chances are, whether they're going to be a boy or a girl, but you don't know when they were born. And so um, what you need to do is work out, you know, all the... Nobody lives forever. The percentage of people who are male or female named Taylor, and you could work out by the number of tailors born in 2009 were still alive, the number of people born in 2008 were still alive, all the way up to 1880. And that will give you the percentage of males and females for tailors. Okay, so how do you go about finding out those things? Because um, people, again, people don't live forever. So you go to the CDC and they have these dusty archives and um, you can actually pull up these things called life tables, which for every 100,000 people, it tells you how many people die of, at a particular age. And I will, I've been through that exercise sort of for you. What you end up finding out is you have these life curves, and it's a very complicated diagram here, but this is the percentage chance of you reaching a certain age, and this is a certain age. And of course, it varies depending on when you were born because of improvements in medicine. So as an example here on 65, click, 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 click. If you're born in the 1900s, the chances of you reaching the age of 65 is a poor 39.1%. If you were born in 1950s, the uh, 67.9, and it gets better and better projected so that actually the projection is if you're born in uh, 2100, the you know, chance of reaching the age of 65 is, is a good 92%. So again, depending when you were born and when that tailor was born and named, you have to know when they were born in order to find out what their chance of still being alive is. 
There are gender differences, and this is actually more recent data for if you have a 50-50 chance, I think this is the year I was born, I've got a 50-50 chance of reaching the age of about 77. If I, were, if I had no Y chromosome, I'd have a 50-50 chance of getting to about 80 years old. So uh, I've, I, I've ignored some of the details here, but I've actually put it in when I've actually applied the real data. Uh, the last slide before we actually start to come back in again. This is 1930s. The other way that you can look at this data is um, based on the age at death. You can see in the 1930s, it's a, a tragic thing. In 1930s, and in fact the 1900s, you had a 1 in 10 chance of not actually making it to your first birthday. You had a 2 in 10 chance of not making it to your fifth birthday. And you can see how things have changed over time uh, in the 1980s and sort of back again. Okay. Finally, bring it all together. So here are the uh, people who are christened or born with that, that, that name, and here is the probability that they're going to die. You multiply all those things together, and what you can work out is the percentage chance of those people still being alive. And what you end up with is a graph, something like this. This tells you all of all the tailors, what is the percentage chance of that tailor being of that age? It's a little bit complicated, so I'm going to uh, square it down, squash it down and actually do it by decades. And if you look here, the tailors are, in, in groups of 10, it's the best. You have about a 44% chance of, of a tailor being uh, a female between 10 and 19 and a 15% chance from there. So who names their child Ethel these days? So we can repeat that sort of same exercise with lots of different names. Here's a chart showing Robert. And the chances are that if you're Robert, you'd get this sort of curve like this. If there's any physicists out in the audience, these are like uh, probability density functions for Heisenberg for the whereabouts the electrons are around sort of uh, atoms and things. So there's Robert. Here's Mary. Mary was an incredibly popular name over here, but uh, most of the Marys at this age are six feet under. So uh, you don't actually have the bar here. The chances are if you meet somebody Mary, they're probably about 50 years old. Jennifer's quite a young name. Terry, that's one of those androgynous names. You meet somebody called Terry, the chances are if you were to roll the dice, they're most likely to be... Uh, um, 50 years of age and, and male. Mini, again, most of the minis were born here, but they're not actually alive anymore. So again, the chances are that they're between 60 and 69 years old. Here we have James. Sarah's quite a young name. Barbara. Sandra. James. Susan. You get the idea. Barbara, she appears twice. I don't know why. Jesse, look at that, that's an, uh, one of those names that uh, are androgynous. Clara, I like. It seems Clara's coming back in popularity. Uh, a lot of people are now naming their children Clara, and again, the other Claras are sort of over here, so the, the superposition of both those curves. Clarence, uh, I'll, I'll go on Edward, we're, we're short on time, so I'll flip. May Harry, Ethel, the one, Florence, John. Okay. Pause for just a second. So remember, we have now this, this probability distribution for uh, ages based on names. Let's look at Facebook, demographics of Facebook. And if everybody came to my presentation last year, you'll know one of the things we talked about was the, uh, the demographics of Facebook. This is a little bit more granular just because it's a cool inverted pair sort of looking graph. But here is the uh, demographic Facebook of people in, in North America. Age is shown on the vertical axis as before, 13 at the top, nobody under 13 on uh, Facebook for couple compliance reasons, 65 at the bottom, Female shown on the right, male shown on the left. One of the things you notice about this straight away, of course, is the very large number of uh, 19 and 20 year old people. Facebook's origins was our, as, our, as our college hookup service, and it's going back to its roots from there. What's staggering um, is also the number of people over the age of 65. One in eight new sign ups on Facebook in North America is somebody over the age of 65. So, you know, go grandma over here. Look at this. Filtering this down to a casual game, here's the Facebook audience filtered down, just showing the people who are, have a positive affinity for Bejeweled Blitz in this case. And these are people who have become fans of the application or have sort of used it. And this is the casual game as we know and love it in 80-20 and the, the, the stay-at-home sort of soccer mom sort of here use the game. One of the things that sort of my company does is actually build these sort of genetic uh, usage demographic patterns for lots of different brands uh, and games. And I think there's a slide that comes up here. So things like... Uh, Call of Duty, Tetris. Each of these little thumbprints here is one of those demographic profiles showing the people who become fans or active users have actively um, opted into saying that they actually like to use this application. Here are examples of some of the things. Uh, Call of Duty, uh, teenage boys love to shoot teenage boys. There's no big surprise there. <laughs> Mythbusters, Ellen DeGeneres, uh, Oprah. <laughs> this is kind of showing an example that if you just looked at uh, female to male ratio, you'd kind of get 
only half the picture. You look at 88%, 88%. It looks as though Ellen and Oprah are the same audience, but no, Ellen skews younger, Oprah skews that little bit older. And we'll, again, we'll see how we can use this later on. Jay Lennon versus Conan, remember the war sort of going on from that. Jay Lennon has this flat response all the way down. People of all ages uh, like Jay Lennon, and again, old people seem to love Jay Lennon. Conan O'Brien, this seems to be this Conan age, uh, 34. Above the age of 34, people don't understand Conan. I don't know why they don't find him funny, so nobody likes him. Once we have these uh, genetic things, we can actually compare them together. Star Wars I love, uh, we get this double hump here. The people in, the, uh, in their 30s and 40s remember the first generation of Star Wars, and here's the Clone Wars and the next generation. Guys look like Pilates, it seems. So if you, if you merge these together and find out what the cross-correlation is, and there's various mathematical ways of doing it, we get a 38% correlation, which is pretty poor. There's a, not a strong overlap between these uh, particular demographics. Star Trek, here we have uh, Captain James T. Kirk and Jean-Luc Picard here. Merging them together, we have a much stronger correlation. Um, in this case, it's 81% uh, correlation between Star Wars users and Star Trek. Once we have them all, we can stack rank all those words. Don't worry, we are going to come back to the, the, the names in a second. But here are the users of uh, Bejeweled Blitz. And we can find out what are their affinities for other applications. So, you know, they like uh, James Patterson novels. They like media, Martha Stewart. Cake, uh, they like cake decorating and other things. And as we go through, the, uh, I've stacked them all in order. I'm going to neutral to skiing, Lord of the Rings, and these are the things that they're less, less likely to. Uh, people who haven't seen it before, you want to guess what's at the bottom? Call of Duty is pretty close, but it's actually Pokemon. Po 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 <laughs> diametrically opposed from for Bejeweled Blitz. Uh, Glee, anybody watch Glee on TV? You want to admit to it? Um, what are the fans of Glee and Facebook interested in? We can do the same sort of exercise. We stack rank them all, group them into categories. And here are the people who watch Glee with their affinity for games. And it finds out that they're into traditional games. They like Sims and Monopoly, Pet Society, Happy Pets. They've got uh, Wii and DS over here compared to Xbox, PS3 down here. So this gives you an idea of what their affinity is between these sort of kind of games. TV shows, they also like Jersey Shore, American Idol, MTV, not so much Howard Stern and Battlestar Galactica, it seems. Music, Taylor Swift, Lady Gaga, Katy Perry, Barry Manilow and Elvis, the, the fans of Glee aren't, aren't, aren't so much fans. But then, you sh neurons hopefully will be firing about other ways you could use it for business. Let's start to get into things. They prefer Pepsi over Coke over Red Bull. Mm. Given a choice of, you know, at Starbucks over McDonald's over Taco Bell over Dairy Queen, Dunkin' Donuts, Pizza Hut. Converse of a Puma, of a Nike, of a Reebok, of a Adidas, of a Crocs. So you can see how you might start to be able to use this information for sponsorship or advertising. Uh, hobbies, they like makeup and fashion. Uh, snowboarding over skiing, uh, NASCAR and gardening, not so much. Give them a choice, horses over cats over dogs. And iTunes over Twitter over Foursquare investing, and they don't like cigars, it seems. So finally, as promised, we can get back to an example. And uh, so I don't actually embarrass anybody who works in the industry. What I've actually done is um, looked at a, a, a product of mine called Great Poker Hands. I sell a poker strategy card product. And the reason I do this, I have access to a large database that um, I can quite happily share with you. So what I actually have is I have a large sales database of many thousands of sales of people who buy poker strategy card products. And I can uh, filter out their first names of all these things. And you see that you know, Robert is the most popular name for people to buy poker products, and John and James and Harry. Now, if you just looked at this, you'd think, hey, that's all male names. Only male buy poker products. Well, th that's a mistake that you shouldn't make. Because the long tail, what you tend to find out is that um, women's names tend to be more in an There's lots of a lot of people called Robert. But uh, women's names are both with creative spellings and the fact that there are an awful lot more women's names than there are sort of men's names. You find that on that long tail, there are lots and lots and lots of sales for just one or two or three people. So if you just took the top 20 or 30 names, you'd get some very different uh, results and very incorrect results. But fitting those all together into those little diagrams, what I have here is a, this is a, a histogram showing the sales of poker card products based on the names of credit card receipts. And then since children under 18 don't actually have credit cards, uh, we can do a little bit of a, an exercise just to clean it up a little bit and show here is what the, the chart looks like. Once we have all that, Going back to the Facebook example, what we can do is we can get our poker card sales database and look at all these uh, Facebook relating sort of uh, interests and keywords or other games and slide them across. I actually do it on a very granular level, but I just for the animation I use the blocks. There's a 45% correlation, for instance, between poker cards and martial arts. And then between Oprah Winfrey Show, it's actually a, a pretty pathetic 34%, and Jersey Shore, even less, they, uh, it's, uh, it's a 25%. The results, this is what we sort of come out with. We come up with a chart here that says, hey, for great poker hand sales, there's a 100% correlation with itself. Uh, that just comes out for, for nothing. They like golf, 
Star Trek, scuba diving, NASCAR, fishing, investing, chess, and Dilbert, of all things. And they're not really interested in Sex and the City, makeup, uh, America's Next Top Model, or Justin Bieber. We're all Justin Bieber. Why can this be useful? CPC. If you wanted to buy Texas Hold'em words on Facebook, $1.73. Golf, 88 cents. You can get 75%, you get three quarters of the audience for less than half the price. So 0.88 divided by 0.7477 is less than 1.73. Google, Texas Hold'em, between two and three dollars. But with scuba diving, you can get 66% of the audience for less than a third of the price. NASCAR, even better bargain, you get 66% of the audience for a much cheaper rate. So you can actually see how, if you want to more efficiently get hold of customers for your games, you can actually buy keywords that there's an incredibly strong correlation. You'll hit the same audience for a cheaper price. So in summary, because I said I'd sort of talk very fast and leave some time for questions and chance to go to the other place. Using just first names, you can estimate the age and gender of your customers actually quite accurately. You probably didn't think you had all this information based on purely the sales database. Um, you can correlate this to other products to get uh, strong brand affinities. You can use this information to lower your acquisition costs. And you can use this information to chase potential sponsorship deals. And with that, I will open it to questions, or if there's anybody from PopCut in the audience, I'll show you a video. Is there anyone from PopCut in the audience? Oh, we, we, we better have some audio then. Let's see who you recognize in this video. So the poker card product we just talked about Is there any audio here? Do you always seem to be holding a losing hand? There are poker hands. Oh, there's no video. And there are great oh. poker hands. No, no video? Great poker hands is a revolutionary no. strategy. Mr. AV guys, any video? No. Can I get my screen back? <laughs> no anyway, to get any video back on screen? It's on my laptop. Okay, I best I'll take questions then. If the video comes back, I'll push play. Any questions? Oh, 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 stand up. So the, <laughs> so the core of all of this, the basis seems to be that, that the belief that everybody who's the same gender and the same age has the same interests. How true have you found that correlation? It's a, the law of large numbers. Um, there, there are, there, if you ask people in the audience, say, hey, hands up who likes Lord of the Rings? And they'll put their hands up, and they put their hands down and say, uh, hands up who uh, likes playing D&D? They put their hands up. The chances are that a lot of the people who put their hands up to one will put their hands up to the other. Of course, there's going to be the weird guy who likes this and also likes SpongeBob but doesn't like all those other things. But, you know, when you work statistically with large things, there are, tends to be correlations. And this is what this is all based about. Yes, you know, I can't be, I'm not tracking each individual user and saying, tell me all your interests, then find another user and saying, tell me your interests, and find another and tell me your interests. They are independent events and I'm sort of going through, but it's just the, the, the law of large numbers. certain size then yes you can sort of do that the other thing that you would you could do if you don't have that size of the market is to sort of go along and say well who is it the audience that I think I want or who has a product similar to me and find out what the size of their market is and then sort of go from there so yes you need to have a, a certain critical size before this data will work and then, until you get that critical size you say well I'm aiming my game at the Star Trek audience and find out what the demographic profile of Star Trek audience is and then filter it from there there was a question over here at one point, but now they felt shy and put their hand around. Oh. Uh, actually, somebody asked the exact same question. <coughs> but uh, just 
as a follow-up, you said these slides would be online eventually at some point? Uh, yeah, I will put them up tonight. If you go to datagenetics.com, there'll, there'll be a link from there. And I know uh, the Casual Connect Association is putting them through from there as well. And that'll be much better for you to digest information. Somebody's going to try and get a video working. Uh, if you want to stick it, you, you, you've got an extra five minutes if you want to try. It's worthwhile. video going, I just wanted to mention that once Nick is done, then our events for this room are done. Um, I believe we have a featured speaker over in the Taper Auditorium that you may be interested in. Um, and then following that speaker, we're going to have a mingle out in the lobby with drinks and food and an opportunity to chat with some of your colleagues. So um, go ahead, Nick. Okay. See how many people from PopCap you can identify in this video for the before mentioned poker cards. Are you fed up with <sighs> poker being just an expensive hobby? Do you always seem to be holding a losing hand? There are poker hands, and there are great <sighs> poker hands. Great Poker Hands is a revolutionary strategy guide to help you play better poker in minutes by teaching you the correct cards to hold. The system Raise. could pay for itself in a single hand. Call this number now or visit our website to have great poker hands rushed to you today for just $20. So, uh, did anybody get them? Travis, Travis and JD, very good. And, and, and Travis's wife as well. Okay, that's it. Thank you.